Hello, everyone, and welcome to the On Air Podcast with your hosts, Stephen Hudson, Paul O'Flaherty, and David Gall. The On Air Podcast is the official podcast for geek conventions and everyone living a geek's life. Hello, everybody. It's Stephen Hudson from Geek Dimensions back again for another episode of the Geek Dimensions Podcast. This week with uh, just my good friend, uh, Paul O'Flaherty down in, in, in Alabama. And David's in Alabama. Yeah, David's off celebrating someone's birthday party. Really? Yeah, we, we, we got stood up for a birthday party. Well, we, we, somebody's partying, dude. Yeah, I know. Well, I guess it's, you know, it, it happens when you get to be famous. You get to go out and you party with people and, you know. We're not wait. famous? Well, no, we're not, unfortunately, yet. Yet. I say yet. You know? How long have you been podcasting and we're not famous? Well, I got, hey, listen, let's just sort of sidetrack here for a bit. We do another podcast together with with Daniel Walters called the Nothing Serious Podcast, which basically the the show, the the, the name of the podcast says everything. That one I could see us becoming famous for. (laughs) (laughs) A geek can be a bit of a dry subject for people outside of the realm. But, uh, you know, everybody's geeky about something. Most people just don't realize. I apologize. You can hear my son crying. That's okay. That's cool. Sarah's with him. Um, but he's at that point. Because we've changed the recording times. We're recording two hours earlier than we usually do. Uh, normally, we record and, you know, the little tyke is fast asleep in bed. But we're recording right now and he's at that cranky stage where he doesn't want to go to bed. And so, Mommy is snuggling him and she get him down. But, uh but yeah, no, I mean, everybody's geeky about something. Most people just don't realize. What yeah, because what we, what people don't realize, you mentioned Doctor Who around Paul, and he, he just literally melts into a pile of gelatinous, oozing ad- adoration for As some... depends on which doctor. Really? Uh-huh. Uh, what's, what's... Okay, here's a question. How, how long is, because I'm not, a Doctor Who fan, never have been, and probably never will be. How? I'm, yeah, I know. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, really, I am. You know, but I'll, I'll forgive you this once. How many? Because I know the early ones. They were like they'd say a season, but a season of of Doctor Who was like Ooh. a yeah. long time. Mm-hmm. Of all the Doctors that you've seen in Doctor Who, because I know you watched from day one right through until the newest one. 50 years worth, yeah. Who's your favorite doc? Uh, top five. Top five favorite doc. I'm not going to do the top five because that's a bit much. Because at that, that, a top five, you're naming out half them. You know what I mean? Okay. All right. I'll give you um, I'll give you my top three. Okay. okay. And and why? And why? You cannot be a geek if you can't give a reason why. Okay. So um, the 10th doctor is my favorite. <laughs> Doctor of all time. That is David Tennant. Now, of course, nah, depending on how you follow the lore, the tenth Doctor may in fact be the eleventh Doctor. But you know, did <laughs> that because they did that whole thing recently where they actually went back and they put in the Doctor that um, appeared just before Christopher Eccleston, who was previously the ninth Doctor. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to give spoilers to that, but. 10th Doctor, best Doctor ever. Why? Um, attitude. He's just a rogue. You know what I mean? He's a lover, not a fighter. And he's just... And it's David Tennant, man. You know? I'm sorry. I've got a huge man crush on David Tennant. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I, I do. He's one of the few people... He's one of the few people in this world that I think my wife would give me a free pass on having uh, an affair with. Um... Him and uh, John Barrowman, who plays uh, Captain Jack Hartness. Also, we got to talk about him too in a minute. Also introduced in the 10th, uh, during the time of the 10th Doctor, and had the spin off series Torchwood. And unfortunately, for those of you listening to this podcast, you can't see, but Stephen can probably see it. Yep. But the room's a bit dark right now. In the background behind me, there's like a life size cutout of David Tennant as the 10th Doctor, and the same for John Barrowman. Second favorite Doctor, um, I suppose it's a bit cliche, but it's the fourth Doctor. 
um, you know, him him of the exceptional scarf. Um, and, oh, he had that hair, like, didn't he? he? Had that like hair, hair. and the hat. Uh, why do I like him? Well, I'm currently sort of I, I've started rewatching all of them, and I'm kind of halfway through to Fourth Doctor's tenure at this point. So I'm on. I think I just started season sixteen, which is about halfway through his tenure, and. There's just something behind his eyes that says, you know what? I'm batshit crazy. <laughs> I'm just batshit crazy. Uh, and it comes out too in some of the episodes, and I, I, I really like it. He's just one of the long-standing favorites. And after that, then, it's probably Peter Davidson, who, um, you know, any man who is... Uh, any man who can pull off wearing a stick of celery as an accessory... Is worthy <laughs> of respect. <laughs> okay, now you. And I'm really, really excited uh, that, that in August we're going to have the first episode with uh, Peter Gabaldi um, as the new Doctor. Huh? Well, Very what's excited. what's your feeling about him as as the the, <laughs> the newest incarnation? First time I, the first time I ever saw him uh, do an interview as the Doctor when they announced him. He came out, he stood on stage, and he held his jacket exactly the same way as the first Doctor did. And it was a deliberate move, a deliberate move to say, you know, I'm going back to the cranky old son of a bitch that the first Doctor... The first Doctor was not a nice guy. He was a cranky old man. He, You would have liked him. You would have gotten on well. Uh, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think it's time for Doctor Who... To stop being the sort of repetitive, family-friendly, always saves the day doctor that he has become, uh, as 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 he's regenerated as the episodes have gone on, um, and it's time for the doctor to get dark and gritty and dirty. And I think if they do it, Peter Gabali is definitely a good choice for doing it with an older actor. And they couldn't do a younger actor. I mean, by Christ, they, he's been getting younger and younger and younger. You know, if they did a younger after a younger actor after Matt Smith, I mean, they would have had to put a child out in diapers. You know what I mean? It was just <laughs> okay. Here, yeah, I have, I have a lot to say on Doctor Who. We could do a whole show on Doctor Who with David Tennant in mind. Did you watch the series um, Broadchurch? You know, I haven't. Um, and You're I'm, a bad, I'm, bad man. Because we have it, and my wife has watched it. Sarah has watched it, but I haven't watched it. Man, you've got to watch that. It is. I, I think like I love British cop shows, police dramas, psychological dramas. Like my, some of my favorite shows are are Wired in the Blood. I thought uh, you were going to say some of my favorite friends are wife. No, um, Waking the Dead. Uh, there's Moses. There's a whole bunch of them that I I absolutely love to death. Uh -huh. I have to put Broadchurch right up there as one of my favorite, and that's why when I heard that they were going to be doing a North American, U.S. network version of it, that and I, then I laughed hysterically like a little girl. Do you want to know why? Why? Because they're actually casting David. Tennant. I know. I know, and I don't understand that. I don't understand that. Uh, basically, it comes down to there would be too much hassle to, um, to what you call it, too much hassle to write backstory for him uh, as to why he's now in America and a detective. And doing the same story. Because basically, it, it's the same story as Broadchurch, but in the, a U.S. city. Exactly. And you want to know something? You want that? Go watch The Killing. But you, you know what? I, I haven't seen The Killing either. But you know what? When it comes to that, I mean, there's very, 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 very few shows will ever make the jump from originally coming out in a, in the UK or in Europe and then being redone for an American audience. Okay, They tried to do it with Red Dwarf, one of the cl classics of comedic parody sci-fi okay um they made an american pilot they kept one character Crichton, uh played by robert llewellyn um as the actual same actor playing the same character 
and then all different actors playing the other characters. And the pilot sucked balls. I mean, it, it, it sucked them hard. It, it was so bad, right? They, I believe, tried to make a pilot of the IT crowd. Yeah. Yeah, no. Here's, there's another one too. Optus made a crossover. Um, and I don't understand why. The original is still best. Another one too that I, I found a hard time, like Torchwood, because we mentioned John Barrymore earlier. Huh? Um, I loved season one. Awesome. Awesome season. Their child, what was it? Season two, children of the, of something or other, which was like four shows uh -huh. was not bad, but then they got into a half and half deal with stars network cables network out of the States. And mm -hmm. that's where they had them coming from England to the U S I'm sorry, but that sucked. It always happens, man. Take a good thing, Americanize it and it dies. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but while we're while we're talking of oh, before you get on to that, okay, interrupt you very very quickly. If you are a fan of Torchwood and you want a good laugh, watch the last season, not this season, the last season of Game of Thrones. Okay, um, the guy who's in Caster's encampment outside the wall. Game of Thrones fans will know exactly what I'm talking about. The guy who goes on about being a badass killer and is cursing everybody out of it and the whole lot is Owen from Torchwood. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. So I'll say I'll leave it at that. Um, while we're on the subject of television and reboots and, and crossovers, Stargate. Yay! I love Stargate. I loved Stargate. Okay. Did you like the movie or did you like the series? Um, I was a big fan of the movie, actually. Uh, James Spader and uh, what's his name? Um, Kurt Russell. Yep. The series was okay. I watched a lot of the series actually when I was living in Denmark. So that'll tell you how long ago that was. Yes. Um, I watched most of it then. And, uh, you know. I don't know. I just couldn't get over MacGyver going everywhere, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but from what I understand, the the one of the co-authors or co-writers of the original movie, uh, Dean Devlin, says they are going to redo it, but it, it will be nothing. It's going to be like a thousand light years in difference from the first one. Now, his reasoning being is that to if they were going to do a sequel to the first one, too many years have gone by. Yes. So basically, and that the first one was originally supposed to be a trilogy. Yes, exactly. But exactly. they they didn't think that the film would go anywhere, so they lost their back. Yeah, because they sold. The, uh, I can't remember. It says here that they they sold they the same like jam. Yeah, and it went off like gangbusters. So what they're doing is basically they're starting all over again. Uh huh. And they're going to be doing a trilogy. <laughs> but I, I, with 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 new characters and uh new storyline. So <laughs> for context, for anybody listening to what I just said, <laughs> somebody just walked past the background of of Hudson's Skype camera. <laughs> He's got a new roommate and I'm like, what the heck was that? Because that was I don't think I was supposed to see what I just saw. Oh well. <laughs> um, but anyway, so what, what do you think? Do you think it's, 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 you know, it's... I'd be excited by a, by a Stargate reboot. I really would. Um, yeah, you know, the Stargate series, especially the first one, as I said, with MacGyver, um, you know, was, well, it was typical semi campy sci-fi for the time. You know what I mean? Stargate has the potential to be really gritty, really dirty, really, you know, and I, I, I'd like to see it the, you know, I'd like to see, I, I, I'd like to see somebody like HBO do Stargate. You know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about for all the sex. I'm talking about for, you know, the dark. Green I was, I was actually reading. 
blood and you know not being afraid to murder characters like George R. R. Martin. If George R. R. Martin would write <laughs> would write Stargate, <laughs> it might be awesome. Okay, here's the thing. What did you think of Atlantis? Uh, I didn't watch enough of Atlantis to have a true opinion on it. How about Stargate Universe? I didn't watch enough of that to have a true opinion on it either. I I'll... I only watched the original. And yeah. The reason being was because when they started to come out. I was going through a series of moving from one country to the other, and uh, yeah. I, 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 I have to say, I wish they had given Stargate Universe more of a chance. I think it had a lot, a lot of potential. Raven about Stargate Universe, that was really, really good. I, if, it, if it comes up on Netflix, try it out. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Other than the fact that they didn't, they didn't continue the series. That's the disappointment as far as I'm concerned. But isn't that always the way? They make something great. It doesn't take off immediately. What happens is it takes off when people actually finally discover it. Yeah. At which point they're already after canceling it, a la Firefly. Yeah, I know. I will never get over the fact that they canceled Firefly. I'm sorry. <laughs> as a UK person, or actually, sorry, Irish UK person, yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. Let's 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 not get too. It's con- Irish UK person. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of this news about the the fact that uh, the the internet filter that Cameron brought in last summer is now just David it's... Cameron is a toss pot. Okay. Let me just add that in provisionally. David Cameron is a complete and utter tosser. He is. He is. Um, right. But the. <laughs> For, okay. If you want to be treated like children, fine. All right? But this whole internet filter thing in England, you know, ISPs being forced to block things. It turns out that they're blocking like 20% of the top 100,000 100, sites. Um, you know, what? it doesn't matter even if those 100,000 sites are all porn. I know. People are adults. They need to be allowed to make adult decisions. But the children. We got to think about the children. Really? No. <laughs> let, let, let's not block the internet. Let's, let's teach parents to teach their kids. Let's, let's, let's approach it that way. You know what I mean? Well, you could live in Western Australia. Oh, don't get me. (laughs) The Australians are as bad as the Germans, right? They have this really bad need. They've got a strong lobbying group in both countries that tends to want to block video games that are R-rated or overrating or rated M, as you would call them. Um, But in Australia, it's it's like Germany. They're absolutely ridiculous in that sense. Uh, These guys want to ban it completely. But you see what they're tying it in with? Like... Okay, it's part of the sexualization of children report. But it's got nothing to do with it. This is like, you know what? It's like what they do here in America, right? Let's let's write a report about how we could save money uh, by not giving farmers money to plant soybeans. And then on the bottom of it, let's tack in a bill so that we can uh, get money for terrorists. <laughs> you know? It's like, what, what does A have to do with B? They make, look, you're worried about protecting the children, okay? I get that. That's fine, right? Enforce the existing bloody laws, right? There's a reason why something is rated R. There's a reason why something is rated over 18. There's a reason why here something is rated M, and you're not allowed sell it to them, okay? It's like, you can't go into a pub and buy a drink if you're under 21. What are we going to do? Are we going to buy alcohol? Because Are we going to ban alcohol because sometimes kids sneak in and get away with it? Fake IDs? No. Solve the fucking problem. All right? Enforce the laws that you have that stop this. Okay? Do not sell it. Put massive, massive fines on retailers that sell an R-rated game. Well, you know, it's a game to somebody that's under the age. Not, you know, not slap on the wrist fines, massive fines. In Canada, uh, 
this is going with your idea. The fact that cigarettes now you cannot buy them if you're under eighteen. Uh huh. Right. A store that is caught selling cigarettes, and they are they're regularly visited by the cigarette police. Um, cigarette police. I know, but the store, no, the person selling the cigarettes can get a five thousand dollar fine the first time. The mm-hmm. store can get a ten thousand dollar fine the first time. It happens again. The employee doing it can get a ten thousand dollar fine, and the store can get a twenty five thousand dollar fine. And that's the way it should be, you know. I mean, encourage them to enforce the actual laws that exist to protect them, as opposed to doing anything else, right? Why write more stupid laws when you can just do it the other way? Okay. Well. Okay. All right. How would what would you do in the case of like with with this whole ruckus about Facebook this week? Okay, it's come out of the fact that they've been manipulating uh, users of the system. Yeah, you know what? I kind of had have a hard time with this, uh, and there's two reasons why. One, they do that anyway. We know they do it. They've always done it, right? Um, two is you know. If you do any kind of marketing or website building, we also do it all the time. It's called A-B testing, right? You set things up one way, see how it responds. To a different percentage of people, you serve something slightly different, then see which one responds well. Google famously did a testing out uh, in one of their interfaces or one of their landing pages. They had uh, they tested out 47 different shades of blue to see which yeah, one. Yeah, the, the Melissa Mayer, the, yeah, yeah. her famous blue test. And, you know, so there's there's good basis for A-B testing. But the thing is, you expect A-B testing in terms of marketing, right? Yep. What you don't expect is a psychological experiment that, that is set up specifically to find out whether or not they can affect the mood of people. That is done in conjunction with the Department of Defense that came out. You see... People see this as an isolated incident, right? It, it, but it's not. It's not. And I'm going to put on my tinfoil hat here, okay? Super uber, uber tinfoil hat, right? So if Facebook can manage to change the mood with, with, with which people post by subtly altering posts when they appear, how they appear, okay? then Facebook can actually affect the mood of a certain percentage of the populace. It doesn't have to be major. See, people people always think, right? Now, get this for going tinfoil hat off the range, right? People always think that insurrection within a country is something that is incited, bang, like no, that. No, it's not. We get so majorly pissed off. Boom, yeah. Boom. That's not how it works. It's little gradual things that change and build up and build up and build up and build up. Well, no, think about it, right? If you're a government and you know that a very large percentage of a country that you want to influence the outcome of an election in, for example, uses Facebook, and you can convince Facebook to you over a long period of time, uh, you know, subtly change the thing so that you're creating a negative response, just a very minor negative response like they did, like, you know, um, but that negative response is there over time. You can actually affect opinions on a large yep. scale. Right? Well, I, well, this, you know, this isn't you... rocket science. I, I'm amazed at how well this just blew over. People think that, you know, the Arab Spring was just like, bang, one minute it was peaceful, next minute everything blew up. The fact is, it wasn't. That What ha- What led into that do, was do just you know, do, you know why, do, do you know why most of the reporting on it is like, it just blew up like that? Because most of the people doing the reporting today are not our age. No. They've grown up in this Instant, everything is instant. We have instantly, we have instant updates, we have instant messages, we have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have everything is like this. You know what I mean? We grew up, we didn't have computers to begin with. And when we did get computers and you wanted to play a game, you took a good half hour to decide what game you wanted to play. Because that game was going to take 45 minutes to load off the damn tape. 
<laughs> you were going to make sure you wanted to play that game because you were going to be playing that game for a while. Because, yeah. Because yeah. you weren't going to suddenly switch your mind and, and, and load something else. Um, where are you, where, uh, and you don't have to be that much older, right? I'm in nope. my thirties, right? But younger than us are typically most of the people who are doing, you know, the reporting on Twitter, tech sites, geek sites, et cetera, et cetera. And they don't really have, most of them don't really have a frame of reference. No, they don't. They don't. Or they, they've kind of grown up in this instant on era, which yeah. I, you know, we've spent Two Large decades. portion of my life in there, you know, but we still have we 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 still have a basis of grounding in reality. I, I was yeah, yeah 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 you yeah. know, and uh, I, I suppose that that affects then how people think think about things and deal with things, you know. And yeah, but you know what? Do you know what? I I wanted to go back to the whole. Uh, them wanting to ban the video games in China. Uh, not China, in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> Almost expected out of China sometimes, but in Australia. Uh, doesn't that kind of fly in the face of this new study? I know. Violent video games may heighten people's morality. morality. I, I, when I saw this, it was like, wait, whoa, wait a second. Am I reading that? Am I not quite reading this right? Or am I? And it was like, Wait a second. Somebody is actually doing a study to look at this thing logically. Yeah. So it was a, it was published in this journal, Cyber Psychology, Behavior and Social Networking. Subjects were randomly chosen to play through video game scenarios, either as a terrorist or a United Nations peacekeeper. After playing, participants were asked to recall real life acts that caused the terrorist players to feel guilty or acts that did not induce guilt for the peacekeepers. Uh, they found that, you know, Americans who played a violent game as a terrorist would likely find that, you know, the the unjust and violent behavior that happened in the game um, to be more immoral yeah. than when they played as a peacekeeper. So, I, but but the, 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 base, the basic fact is, is that these games are not making, pe- the, you know, people more violent. Look, it, here... You and I both know that we've been down this road, I don't know, how many fucking times. Look, it's it's like everything else, right? Internet gambling sites do not make you a gambler, right? Casinos do not make you a gambler. Uh, they facilitate, but they do not make you that. Hookers right? don't make you a sex maniac. Hookers don't make you a sex maniac. Uh, guns don't kill people. Um, you know... All these things we like to blame on other things, but the fact of the matter is, if you have an addictive, obsessive personality, then you are at risk, no matter what you do, right? And we have to find better ways of dealing with the fact that different people have different psychological makeups and may not be capable of, or may be easily influenced by, or may become addicted to because, and stop banning everything for everybody else and just say, look, we need to find, figure out how to treat these people rather than, you know, handicapping everybody else because of it. You know, it's, um, it's basically, I was a George Carlin that said it. It's like banning steak because babies can't, can't chew it. Yeah. You know, babies can't chew it. Therefore nobody can have steak, you know? And that's what, it, that's what it is. You know, bleh. It, yeah. what, one of the one of the big discussions that came out of um, E3, and I know you didn't follow it that much, but was was there were, and this started actually a few days after or a week after E3 was over. But this big discussion about no women character roles within video games, it, like there's just a, a dearth of them. Nobody because I think it was Assassin's Creed was at Bio Bioware. Yeah. Said that they wanted to have a woman protagonist, but they didn't have time. Well, that's BS. Now, let's flip this around. We now find out that Dragon Age in, in Inquisition, which is uh, by the looks of it going to be an awesome looking game, is going to have the very first gay character. Now, is he the very first fully gay character? Or is he just the very first fully gay main player? 
No, as, for, as far as I can tell, um, I remember a couple of years ago a whole hoopla about you know some video game having gay characters, and you know what? Okay, Here, here's um, Bio, Bio, Bioware had previously only introduced one exclusive gay male non-party member in Mass Effect Three, and also in Knights of Old Republic included one gay female party member. But apparently, Dorian, who is the um, uh, an, an elemental mage in the New Dragon Age, is yeah. And wasn't there a bisexual character in Dragon Age Two? I don't think so. Yes, I'm reading the comments on Polygon. People are oh, okay. Like there was a bi character. Uh, you know what? I don't know. Maybe it's because the production of video games is a predominantly U.S. dominated thing. I don't know. Maybe I'm completely wrong on that statement too. <sighs> There's nothing wrong with being gay. Absolutely nothing wrong with being gay. I don't know why maybe it's because they're selling to youtubers uh i don't know um video games should reflect the full diversity of the population it's that simple all right um we have gay people straight people lesbians whatever the fact that there's a gay person in a video game or the lead character should not be a thing I agree with you. It just should be. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, you know, so-and-so is gay. You know what? Your character should be whatever you want them to be. You customize your avatar anyway. And, 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 what, and you know, what do you do about, you know, what do you say about the psychology of, of men playing these games that play as women? You know what? <laughs> um, I've played a lot of video games as women. So have I. That's that's usually my 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 go to character. Do you know why? No, it's usually because the female characters tend to be more interesting, in the sense that um, you take Diablo for example. You know, uh, well, not maybe Diablo is not a good example because it, it it gives you male and female options for every character. Um, but in a lot of video games, the male character here's the problem: the stereotyping happens for the males as well as it happens for the females, right? So the male characters tend to be these uh, great big uh, hulks, great big hulking slow behemoths with fucking axes or whatever. And female characters tend to be more agile, not quite as powerful, require more reflex and skill to play. You know, and, and that's that. That's really it. And I suppose the other side of it is, you know, especially if you're playing anything from a, a third person perspective, is if you have to watch an ass walking around in front. Of for twenty hours. <laughs> yeah. Why do you want to watch a bloke? <laughs> I, I I have heard that explanation given I don't know how many times. Because it's, just, it's it, true. It cracks me up every time. And I you I use it too. So you know I am just as to blame. Switching away from games to science, because there's a couple of really cool stories uh regarding 3D printing that have come out really cool stories that make me think that if google invests in any of these companies we will have like the t1000 running around here within the next year or two especially considering they bought boston dynamics and the whole lot that's that totally blew my mind when they bought that company because the main customer of boston dynamics is the defense yeah you know you know the united states army yeah you know like that just blew anyway it's Google makes everything now from AI to defense robots. I know. <laughs> everything in between. I know. And and they basically want to – the one I like too is the, the – uh, recently they, they want to launch – I think it's like 120, 150 oh, mini – the, no, no, mini satellites. And they don't they don't go at the optimal satellite. They, they, they go in, in between range and they will – Provide high speed internet access via these is satellites. That in conjunction with the loons? Then? No. This, they want to do this, the loons for high speed internet access. Yeah, but they want that for. I think that was the prelim to this because they're going to use that more in, in rural areas or low. low um, satellites can't get to rural areas? I, no, I, all, I'm, all I'm going by is, is what I've read in the news. And the fact is that they are, they're using this satellite. Yeah. Because they, they bought a company that 
specifically builds these type of small like they're tell me about these, me about these 3d printed blood vessels That's all. okay what it boils down to is one of the problems when they when you 3d flesh 3d print flesh it will look it will act and it will behave just as human flesh but you cannot pump blood through it to feed it so what they've done now is they found a new way is where they 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 was it uh, have solved this, some of these problems by creating a skeleton of vessels and then growing human cells around them. Once the vessels are stable, they are able to dissolve the 3D printed material, thereby providing basically veins, blood vessels. And the 3D printed human flesh or muscle, right, is able to be kept alive by your own blood. That's awesome. I it it totally blew me. Like I am a big. I think three D printing can, will do more to change our society than since anything since this, the the industrial so revolution. We take that and then we add it to the fact that researchers have come up with these little robots that are basically uh, <laughs> muscle powered, little bits of muscle that is electrically, you know, they're bio muscles. Uh, yeah, bio muscle you pass electric yeah. through muscle and moves. That, that that makes the robots move, and I'm telling you, aren't you <laughs> becoming looking for John Connor very very soon? I think it's cool. I really do. I I think I think what they're doing in the area of medicine and 3D printing is it is phenomenal. It's maybe, maybe someday, maybe someday, the Tin Man will have a heart. You know, you could be right. But what does that do for the straw man and, 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 and the cowardly lion? Well, they may be able to print the brain too for the straw man, but the cowardly lion is right out of luck. <laughs> He's shit out of luck. Anyway, it looks like we're, we're kind of through our, our, so anything you've got happening that, uh. Oh, really, man. I spent like, I've spent most of this week working. I spent all of today, like the building a studio for a client, basically putting together a studio. Um, I've not really, I've not really had a lot of time to play with cool stuff. Well, I I recently actually as oh yes. hang on hang on hang on hang on I did. okay all right I did I did I did uh hang on um crap hola all right inkydeals dot com for the designers and stuff in the audience and this this will be available for the next um. Five days, I think. So if you're listening to the podcast, you kind of, you kind of got to go and do it. I'm dropping the link into the show notes there. Okay. Uh, Inky Deals has an epic bundle for designers. They have a $49 bundle and they have an $89 bundle, right? Now, what it is, is it's hundreds and hundreds of vector packs, vector illustrations, brush packs, Photoshop and Illustrator add ons, uh, t shirt design templates, t shirts. Uh, high res texture packs, premium fonts, tutorials, and web and print resources. There are thousands and thousands of dollars worth of stuff here. Even if you manage to get all this stuff for free, the amount of time it would take you to aggregate it. Oh, I know. Uh, oh, is, I re- a phenomenal. Um, I, I, I paid for this today. Uh, 89 bucks it cost me. Uh, there's a $49 version as well, but the $89 version. It comes in like 35 zip files. The first one I downloaded today was 1.2 gigs on its own. Um, I wish I could it's get It's an it. amazing around. Would... Am... Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of cool. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there's an amazing amount of resources here. Um, they look really, really awesome. If you're a designer, uh, even just a hobbyist, um, there's a lot of stuff in this pack that will save you time and save you reinventing the wheel uh, definitely worth the 89 bucks, uh, cool. or 89 bucks. okay so. well we'll definitely get that out there um actually yesterday i started playing with um google play music the, the music service from google and i like it it's not bad the only problem i had or and not so much anymore because i managed to find one that works is that you basically had to have a browser window open all the time even with no, the, you, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> there is an offline client. Where? 
Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. But I'll tell you this. I'll tell you what I do know is that I did previously use it to upload my music to Google Play. Okay. Now, I did find a desktop client which yes. is plays, and it's on SourceForge. Does that no, sound familiar? Oh, oh, you mean to listen to your music? Not yes. That. No, you, I mean, you listen to it on your phone, man. You know. No, I listen to it on my desktop. Play app, or you use Google Play in the browser. I'm sure, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, non-Google clients that will play. I found one that works very well, which I'll include in the show notes. But I, I like it. I like it a lot, actually. And even their um, recommendation engine for creating play, um, what do they call it? Uh, oh, I don't know. Anyway, for, for for listening to music in a row sort of thing. Yeah, playlists. Yeah, but the the, the automatic one where just yeah. – anyway. We know what you mean. Yeah, it works. It works really well. I was quite impressed with it. So yeah, that's one to keep in mind. If you if you haven't tried Google Play Music yet, folks, give you it know a what? shot. It's a good place to put up twenty thousand MP3s. Uh, yeah, that you can stream whenever and wherever you want. Um, back in the day, they had a few issues. All right, you know, with uh, uploading songs, if you didn't have them tagged properly before they went up, it was a mess. But now you can actually change the ID three tags online. Um. But you know, do yourself a favor and upload them properly in the first place. Why isn't your collection? Why isn't your ID? Why aren't your ID tree tags right in the first place? You're obviously not doing music right. No, you're not. As I sort of wonder about some of mine. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> on that note of geek goodness, I guess we'll call this show to an end, and you oh. get you head back to your wife and child and children and. Yep, all the sproglets are here. Yes. So, folks. Thanks for joining Paul and myself, and we will see you next week for another episode. Uh, but always remember, one more important rule. Always, always keep it geek. You have been listening to Geek Dimensions On Air Podcast with Stephen Hudson, Paul O'Flaherty, and David Gall. You can send any feedback about this or any of our other episodes to feedback at geekdimensions.com or by leaving a comment on the post. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus as Geek Dimensions. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Blueberry, and PodcastPD.org, or you can use our RSS feed for the show. The music used in the show is Metro by Sleep Thief. The On Air Podcast is the official podcast of Geek Dimensions and everyone living a geek's life.